they're kind of seeing an animal. But there are alternatives in that respect um, that might be utilized. Also, um, under soils and uh, geology, I'd like to see the scoping um, of the, any pesticide or any chemical that would be proposed for use uh, to be used, uh, the full formulation, not the active ingredient, to be, uh, to be tested and to make sure, uh, to see what the migration rate and the um, solubilities and the movement of those chemicals would be through the soil in a timely period, having to do also with um, heat and sun and uh, climate conditions at the time. Uh, my organization is definitely, uh, definitely against any kind of chemical applications um, and under human health hazards, looking at the lo uh, lowest possible um, combination of contamination of the water supply and how it would affect uh, human health. Um, that, I think, definitely needs to be a part of the uh, scoping under human health hazards. Thank you. Thank you, Ginger. Um, after Gene Spake, Sarah Spector. Hello, I have no prepared remarks. <coughs> Pardon me, but I, some issues do occur to me in this process. Number one, um, I heard from the lady in the beginning that it looks as though uh, this is not an even playing field between the uh, natural methods against the uh, herbicide, herbicide methods. <clears throat> you sort of ruled it out because of budget matters. Well, if you start from that position, uh, you load it, really. I, what does budget have to do with this issue? I thought you would uh, uh, look at the environmental effect. I heard you say something about fire, uh, control fire, having its own uh, environmental uh, problems. Oh, that's true. Too. But budget? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, and I, I'm with the people who have said, uh, who have spoken to this issue quite eloquently here today. And the, th the only thing I'd leave you with, because um, I really haven't studied this document in, in, in full, and when I do, I'll probably submit something in writing, but just this, that here we are, decades, I mean decades, after Rachel Carson, and we're having this discussion. I mean, frankly, I don't know where you put that in your, your highly restrictive uh, uh, sort of constrained uh, method of uh, receiving comments such as mine. Maybe it doesn't fit into your, uh, your model, but I really think we should look at the big picture here. And uh, people are very, very concerned. And yet we're, we're, we're proceeding under this illusion that somehow we have to discover, perhaps, maybe, sometime, somewhere, someone could be injured by chemicals. I mean, this is, this is material from John Stewart's program. <laughs> We've been through this for decades. And the country is uh, falling uh, over with, with various diseases and cancers all over the place. It's not just this particular group of uh, substances, of course, and they're all around us. I've had several friends die of uh, prostate cancer, tramping around golf courses, mostly. And uh, you don't have to tramp around golf courses to come in contact with some of these, some 30 chemicals that they use. And frankly, I'm sick and tired of seeing somebody with a total suit on spraying uh, poison in the cracks in the sidewalk. I mean, I think we have reached the level of insanity. With this. <laughs> so that, that's it. Right. Oh. So thank you for restraining the, the, the urge to clap. I know really <laughs> After Sarah, it's Lynn, and I'm not going to get even close. <laughs> Lynn was this. Uh, Long and difficult name. Is she here? F F G. F D. Oh, would you like to come? Okay, great. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Sarah Spector, and I don't think I could really probably articulate um, any better what's been said than what everyone else has said so eloquently. I, I definitely want to throw my hat in for um, a medical toxicologist and you know um, the insanity vote. Um, but I, I also wanted to mention on a slightly, well, very, really, oh, and actually this comes under human health hazards, hydrology, water quality, recreation, land use, um, air quality, greenhouse gases, biology, um, agriculture, forest, green, mineral resources, population, housing, public, yeah, so pretty much everything. And um, the related issue of uh, fluoride in our water, which I know isn't supposed to be the subject at hand, but I have a close friend who's been trying to get fluoride out of our water for a long time, and she keeps being told that there aren't enough people who are against it, and of course we know fluoride is rocket fuel, and I, I suspect most people here would prefer it not be in the water. So, that's all I have to say. After Lynn, Tony Mossy. For the record, my name is Lynn Feinerman, and uh, <laughs> Uh, my comments, I guess, come under, yes, uh, many, most of the headings up there, uh, human health hazards, biology, water quality, etc. Um, I would like to make a response and try to couch it in a way that it fits with the um, requests of the people who are formulating the EIR. Um, I am responding to the comment that um, working to clear French broom or whatever other weed is unsuccessful when you do it by hand. I just uh, shared a success party with a bunch of people in Tiburon who have cleared out the open space near the old church um, by hand and done it very successfully and uh, eliminated most of the French broom. So I would request that um, in the process of, of creating this EIR, that you do a thorough search for success stories with um, uh, hand, uh, the use of people's elbow grease, as they say, um, uh, rather than just presuming uh, by certain people's testimony that it doesn't work, because in fact I have seen evidence that it works quite well. Um, the other thing is that I would uh, ask the um, EIR to formulate um, a way of paying people to do this work. Um, it doesn't have to be a great amount, but I don't think that, uh, I think that, you know, relying on volunteers is unrealistic in terms of the ecology economy equation, which has to be approached holistically. And um, the other thing I would request um, is that in formulating the EIR that every member of the participating formulating group read Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. After Tony. Marito Ash, forgive me. Uh, my category is biology, and I haven't yet read the report, but if it hasn't been looked into, uh, maybe for kind of the control of the invasive brood, uh, if we look at biological insects, I don't know, I know there are certain insects that feed specifically on brood, and in looking at that, then also uh, kind of evaluate how the use of the chemicals would then interfere and be counterproductive with that. That's it. The next speaker is Phil Sauter. Hi, um, I'm Mirto Ash. I'm a family doctor here in Marin. I'm also on the advisory board for MoMA's Moms Advocating Sustainability. Um, and I'm here to talk a little bit about um, some of the trade-offs. I think we're trading off um, concerns, there's human health hazards, which fires are, of course, but also life as it is, as it turns out, and also um, quality of life. And again, it's the same trade-off between um, the recreation and, and uh, getting sick from the glyphosate. So glyphosate is quite toxic. One of the important things to realize is that um, the regulatory agencies have failed to protect us, it's very clear from the literature, and there's actually a study from just this past week 
uh, that was published, and that shows exactly how some of the European regulatory agencies just um, systematically misinterpret what is in the studies that have already been done. So I don't know about the one that's being done for, you know, in 2022, but to me the, the data is in. Um, so the first thing to understand is these pesticides are endocrine, dis endocrine disruptors, and that unfortunately this, this means they don't play by the rules of what we have known in the past to be toxic. So there is no, in fact, lower limit that's safe, and that makes it really hard to argue um, about is it okay to add more? Um, do we have to eliminate all of it? I mean, these are all things that we might want to think about. But still, um, glyphosate disrupts the same biochemical pathway that's disrupted by the drug Accutane. And that's a critical pathway used by vitamin A, and the consequences of disrupting it are birth malformations. Um, Accutane users have a 30% rate of craniofacial, cardiovascular, thymic, and central nervous system malformations. Um, so I'm concerned that some of the cases that we see, we don't even know what the cause is, but in fact could be related to the fact that the glyphosate is out there uh, in round, as Roundup, but also as many other generic um, pesticides, uh, glyphosate. Um, there, um, the use of, you know, I read some of the report, um, and it really did strike me that it seemed like a possibility that in fact some of it was going to be used. And so I started thinking about what would be a way to make this a win-win. And um, what I'm realizing is, for example, it's a graphic example at my house in San Rafael, they're spraying the median with hazmat suits and someone who has a backpack. I didn't even find out what he was spraying. And then a block away behind my house, which is right next to open space, there are people that are removing the broom by hand. So I don't want any glyphosate, and I want as little as possible, and if there was a way to get um, the water district to be involved in reducing the use of glyphosate, for example, by putting a warning in people's water bills so that people would know not to buy the stuff at the store and not to use it, we would be way ahead, I bet, compared to the amount of glyphosate that might be used by the water district on the broom. So that's one thought, that one possibility I thought would be a win-win a for both of us. Can you very well? After Phil, Cindy Whitman Bradley. Uh, my name is Phil Sauter. I live in Woodacre, and I'd like to address uh, health and human hazards, biology, and mitigation. Um, I'd also like to provide some information from a study that the uh, Point Reyes National Seashore uh, Park Service just performed where they looked at uh, mechanical control burn and chemical treatment of broom. It's very informative particularly with the protocols that they used on uh, chemical treatment uh, and the testing that they did to make sure that the water bodies remain um, completely uh, absent of glyphosate. Uh, mm -hmm. Second, I think that the EIR should discuss uh, particularly vectors of infestation. How does broom get transmitted? I don't think MMWD exists as a alone. You share a lot of border with private residences. You also share miles of border with Marin County open space. And to look at the water district in isolation, I think, is, is uh, inappropriate. Um, I worked with uh, Roger Buckholz to clear out a tank site on Upper Conifer, and it was clear that there was uh, scotch broom within that tank site, but not outside the fenced area except for one plant. Uh, the Park Service hypothesizes that seeds come in on their tire treads of their own trucks. So I think that the water district should look at how things are getting transmitted into the water district and how they transmit to other surrounding areas. Uh, next, I think that the objective of the EIR should have an end result of not only eradicated invasives, but leaving behind a healthy, sustainable uh, body of native species. I think there should be replanting of natives because if you clear out the invasives and don't put anything else in there, more invasives are likely to come in. Um, second or third, I think that the EIR should have quantitative and objective information. I don't think it's a good idea to say something was rejected because it's too expensive. I'd like there to be enough a um, actual data in the in the study so that we can uh, actually go in and look work the numbers ourselves and make sure that nothing has been overlooked and that we understand how the conclusions were reached. Uh, next, I think that there should be. Uh, in the EIR, a, a, a very vigorous uh, process for public notification of any um, chemicals that are used, any treatment, 
in time for the public to know before it's going to be used and what they can do to prevent it. Uh, and finally, I want to echo. Uh, uh, I want to echo the, the, the folks who have said that it should not be budget driven. We should look at what's the best way to rid the water district of invasives and sustain and, and bring in that um, sustainable um, uh, uh, native species and look at budget driven as, as kind of a paragraph at the end to figure out what's the best thing to do in terms of solving the problem. Thank you. Thank you. After Cindy, uh, Jack, Barry. I'm Cindy Bradley, and um, by profession, I am a birth doula, which means that I support women during childbirth. And I want to speak to um, human health hazards, and I want to speak specifically about um, pregnant women and fetuses and <coughs> neonates, um, infants. Um, these chemicals are poisons, and while they affect all of us um, and affect our endocrine systems, um, the fetuses and neonates are particularly vulnerable. There is no safe level for putting these kinds of chemicals and poisons into our systems. This shouldn't even be on the table. We need to be protecting ourselves and we need to be protecting our babies. Um, it seems to me that what we've heard already in this room is testimony from a lot of people in the medical field who have the information that you need of the studies that will show you that we shouldn't be doing this. Um, we know this from Rachel Carson, but we also have experts within our community who can help you. So reach out to these experts. Let them direct you to the studies that are going to show you that there is no place in our watershed, or in our homes, or on our streets for these deadly poisons. Thank you. After Jack, Margaret Ketnan Zagart. Is Margaret here? Is Margaret here? Yeah. All right. Good. All right. Hi, my name is Jack Barry, and I'm here basically for mitigation. Uh, I've heard a lot of uh, good things about everything. <coughs> Everything's great. The thing is, uh, the Water District has actually been doing a lot of work, hand pulling and what have you, but it hasn't been working. I grew up in Wood Lane and Fairfax, and I've seen what happened. My backyard is completely full of broom now because of spillover from Municipal Water District land. I pull a lot of broom in my time. I actually get paid to do it. And, uh, <coughs> Everything's good. The goats are great, but they spread it by dispersing in the, in the bathroom. They spread it that way. Chickens will actually kill chickens if you let them eat it. So the thing I really want in the EIR is what's the toxicity of the plant? If you let it go unchecked, the seeds are grazing animals, can't go into it. Even if I'm around this stuff, I have to put on gloves because if I'm pulling it for a certain amount of time, I can actually feel. I feel a little bit different. So as far as this would be like being a firefighter and not being used, being able to use all your tools, I think if you limit this thing to not using herbicides, you'll never get a handle on it. And you know, I'm not a big advocate, advocate on toxicities or anything like that, but the thing is, Everybody's overlooking what this plant is doing to, to the native habitat, the animals, quails. You see a lot of quails out in the wilderness these days in areas where there's broom? It's killing them. Did you realize that? And here, we can come in here and reinvent the wheel again, but why don't you go to, there's a, a right here, California Invasive Plant Council. Look it up on the internet. They've gone through case studies and case studies of all this stuff, and you can use herbicides. I use it very well. We cut our plant, we hit it with a dye, that's a herbicide, and hardly any contact at all with this stuff. Then we're out of there. We've been managing 120 acres, had five acres of broom on it. There's not one broom plant now six inches tall on that property. With minimal amount of damage, pulling the stuff, you're eroding, what happens is even, okay, I don't know if everybody knows about French broom, but trying to get this stuff in check is going to be tough. These seeds can last 30 years, okay, in the soil. 
The thing is, when you go pull it, what happens is it disturbs that seed bank. After you cut, pull, what have you, you disturb the seed bank, 40% of the seeds come around, and everybody knows how many seeds come out of this stuff, right? Between seven to 15,000 seeds per plant. So what's happening now is when you're pulling this stuff, it actually spreads the seeds and germinates them, so you're gonna have 40% the first year, 25% germination the second year, then after that, you can probably start pulling it by hand. But just to, what's that? Okay, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Sure. And after Margaret, Tom Fitzpatrick. I would like one of the scoping. I would like one of the scoping comments to be uh, the climate, because we have microclimates, and I've noticed that things should be done in dry season. And the dry season is very seasonable, and it varies within a day. And we have lots of uh, variations. We have fog, we have sun, we have results. So I think there should be uh, of an analysis of the, the seasons and the impact of variation. I think that we should uh, realize that there is something in terms of aesthetic, uh, visual, using burn, dark burn areas has an aesthetic uh, disadvantage. And it was a Native American way to proceed, but we now have uh, human impacts. So that uh, is a consideration when you're talking about burn. And another thing, burns don't always work. Several times burn have uh, accelerated fires. In uh, the southern Marin area now, it's the very highest, air where I live, it's the very highest risk for fire. And I noticed that one of the recommendations of the MMWD is just to use inundation uh, or re removal of hazard for, for fire. But uh, the cutting and the bringing in of equipment spreads. There have been studies, uh, for example, the, um, oh, in Delaware County, they found that the use of equipment has to be done in dry weather, which we don't always have, because uh, it carries the uh, problem of, of seeds. And uh, another thing that is, you talk about native species replanting. There's a good model right by the uh, Presidio and the uh, GGNRA where they take native plants, grow seeds, and have actual plants to transplant into areas immediately. So I think that that should be using that. Uh, there should be no planting, replanting, or encouragement of bay trees, which is a native, but because bay trees are the primary host for uh, sudden oak syndrome, that and they are also a high fire risk. So I think bay trees should be removed completely. Thank you.